everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Emily Sumner, and I'll be your host today. I'm pleased to be with you on behalf of the SEL Exchange hosted by CASEL. Before I share um, a little bit more about the SEL Exchange, I'm going to go through a few quick tips to help the webinar run smoothly for you. We have the chat open, and many of you have already um, shared greetings with the group, so keep that up. And you're also welcome to share your any thoughts or ideas that come up for you throughout the presentation and chat. You can use that chat feature to reach out to me with any technical problems and I'll do my best to resolve them for you. One thing you can do right now to make the webinar run smoothly is to close all of the other applications on your computer and all of your other internet browser tabs. So close out Word, PowerPoint, any Adobe applications you have open. This just makes sure all of your internet and computer bandwidth goes to power Zoom. Um, if you do have audio or video lags that last more than a second or two, you can pop out of Zoom and come right back in and that usually resets the connection for you. I'm sure you're gonna have a lot of questions throughout today's presentation and we're excited to have them. Um, so we are gonna be holding a live Q&A at the end. Uh, so feel free to send in those questions as they come up for you throughout the conversation. Um, to ask a question, look for the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar and type your question in there. We'll get it and we'll put it into the queue to be answered during the Q&A period. We are recording today's webinar and we will email you a link to that recording along with your certificate of attendance. All right, so as many of you know, each year CASEL hosts the Social and Emotional Learning or SEL Exchange, which is a unique and timely forum for those who are committed to social and emotional learning. Last year, CASEL had close to 2,500 people from around the globe join the virtual summit, and these included researchers, practitioners, young people, and community leaders. This year's virtual summit is gonna be held on October 14th and will offer four hours of learning centered around how you can activate SEL to create conditions where young people can find their sense of purpose and channel their strengths towards achieving personal and collective goals. Registration is open and we've got lots of people already set to join us on October 14th. So we encourage you to um, register today at um, the URL we're gonna put in chat, which is selexchange.castle.org. Um, I would like to acknowledge the very generous support provided by many organizations that are making a difference with SEL. Um, our more than 20 sponsors are dedicated to advancing SEL through innovative products and programs. Uh, and today I want to give an extra thank you to our um, sponsor of today's webinar and the SEL Exchange Committee for Children. Committee for Children is a global nonprofit whose work champions the safety and well being of kids through social emotional learning. Committee for Children is the creator of the Second Step Social Emotional Learning Program, and we encourage you to learn more about Committee for Children and uh, Second Step, and we'll share some of that information um, in chat now, as well as in the um, follow-up email that you get, you'll receive um, in the next day or two. All right, so today's panel discussion was actually pre-recorded, so I'm going to start that recording now, um, but we will be holding that live Q&A at the end with Dr. Tia Kim, who is the one moderating the recorded conversation. Um, so just give us a second and we'll get that recording launched for you. Hi there, I'm Tia Kim, the Vice President of Education Research and Impact at Committee for Children. Committee for Children is an organization that develops social emotional learning programs and works with educators and schools across the country to help support the social emotional competence of children and youth. Today we have a great conversation with some excellent panelists around the intersection of SEL and civic engagement. So let's go ahead and introduce our panelists today. If each of you could just go around and tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do, that would be great. So why don't we start with Sharon, just tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do and then we'll just kind of go around. Hello everyone, my name is Sharon Bradley. I am a Director of Family and Social Services and Social Emotional Learning in Plano um, ISD. That is about 20 miles north of Dallas here in Texas and um, I gotta say about eight years ago, I was introduced to social emotional learning and it just totally totally invigorated me in, in my career. Um, I'm now starting my 21st year in education and um, I'm just spreading the, the good news and the good work of SEL that I believe can be the driving force for change, you know, throughout. Great, Adam, do you wanna go next? Sure, yeah, nice to see y'all. Um, my name's Adam Alvarez. I'm an assistant professor in urban education at Rowan University. That's in Southern New Jersey. Um, 
Uh, prior to that, I was um, an elementary teacher for six years. I worked at a residential treatment facility, which is uh, kind of like a, a, a juvenile justice setting, but more therapeutic, uh, supposedly. Um, and, and really, that's where I, I kind of learned um, about the various needs that kids have in terms of learning, but then also sort of non-academic skills and learning as well. Um, and I would say probably my third year, I realized that uh, nothing really gets done in class until teachers learn to uh, be a little bit more caring about their students, uh, to be a little bit more transparent. Um, so uh, I come to the space with, you know, six years of, of elementary teaching. I did my uh, master's in educational leadership and policy. Uh, and then my doctorate was in education with an emphasis on urban education. So, so now my research really looks at the intersection of uh, race, exposure to violence, and trauma in K to 12 teaching and learning context. Great, we have that in common, Adam. Actually, I worked in a residential treatment facility for adjudicated boys for youth too. So more on the counseling side, not the education side, but that's a nice connection. Great, Shaniqua, if you can go next and just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, that would be great. Sure, um, my name is Shaniqua Mustafa. I am the assistant principal for Carolina Park Elementary School in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Um, I've been in this role for about two years. Um, it's amazing here. Little kids are awesome. Um, prior to being an elementary school principal, I was a sixth grade English teacher um, at Jerry Zucker Middle School. It's the amazing experience of my life. Um, it was there that I realized and I learned um, by a conversation with a colleague I'm um, sharing some personal experiences that I had been a victim of abuse and trauma. I didn't know that. Um, and she very plainly said that these are things that you experience and they're not okay. Um, throughout my career, we had the school adopted a um, behavioral based curriculum called capturing kids hearts. And so the whole premise of the program is that if you can grab a child's heart, you can pretty much teach them anything. A large part of our uh, population at Zucker, those kids had behavioral challenges. And so we figured if you could connect, connect with them at a social emotional level, then you could teach them anything. Um, it was during my time there that I realized that my own personal experiences mirrored like their present experiences. And so it was through those experiences that I was able to like establish organic relationships with kids. And it made it easy to teach them content. You just can't teach a kid English if their basic needs are not being met. So you have to acknowledge that you have to teach the whole kid in order to get the content in. Thank you, and thank you all of you for sharing a little bit about yourselves. But just to start us off, I'd really like us to just think a little bit about social emotional learning, particularly given these times. Um, all of you are in education or are educators, and so most of the schools in our country have gone back to fully in-person education, you know, either this week or the following um, past month. And so, you know, they've been dealing with a lot. I know for myself, you know, the past year and a half has been a roller coaster of emotions. There's, you know, from fear to kind of loneliness and sadness and kind of fear of the uncertainty and unknown. I know my kids have felt the same way. And I know a lot of students are coming to our classrooms like that. So just in um, your own work and your own thinking, what do you think is the best supports and mechanisms that schools and classrooms can set up to really support kids as they move back into in-person school and to really meet and support their social emotional needs. So, you know, anyone just jump in with your thoughts. Wow, you're right. The last 18 months has been hard on everyone. And in my opinion, I believe that intentionally focusing on that social reconnection um, I think is key, and that is infusing relationship building activities into the existing structures. Um, and the reason why, over the last 18 months, everyone, adults, students, they've had to live and work in, in these odd, extensive circumstances, and everyone's story is different. So now that we're all coming back together, just being intentional about um, that social reconnection so that we can reestablish not just the physical safety, but the psychological and emotional safety. Because when our kids feel safe, they can learn. 
Can I add to that, Miss um, Sharon? I think also being like intentional to create like opportunity and space. I know sometimes when you work with teachers, um, we, we like to be in control of things and we like to know what's happening next. And we like agendas and bullet points and we have scope and sequence and timelines and things that we have to check off. But I believe like just creating opportunities to have space within our classrooms, content is always going to be there. You will always have opportunity to teach science and social studies and math and all of those things, but just being really intentional about creating space and like making times and moment to be, to build, reconnect like culture and climate within our classroom. You, you made a very great point that the past 18 months has looked totally different for everybody, even the people that are on a part of this conference call at the moment. So maybe giving a time to acknowledge that giving an opportunity for kids to feel their big feelings or their big emotions, and then giving name to those things, just creating a space where it feels like safe to be able to do that. Sometimes we get in a rush to do the things that seem important, but they're not always the most important thing to do at that time. So I have a question. I really do resonate with the creating better connections, the social connections in particular, because a lot of kids have not been um, in person for a really long time. Do you, does anyone have like a really good activity or an idea that they've used in the classroom before that they feel really works and helps build these connections or relationships? I'd love to hear. Well, for, well, for me, uh, tonight will be my first class back. <laughs> so um, I don't have a, a set of strategies, but for me, it always comes back to, um, you know, the idea of humanization. And so I think that even, you know, when I think back to my elementary teaching um, uh, years, a lot of what was really successful for me was just being transparent and recognizing um, the different power dynamics that, that I'm involved in, you know? So um, recognizing the different power dynamics in, in the class, uh, such as my being uh, a, a man, of being a large, you know, physically large man, um, also being a professor in a in a room of students, I think too many times those uh, power relationships go unaddressed, and we we do more harm than good. So you know, just being upfront about the different types of uh, privileges we have sometimes can can be really helpful for uh, uh, bringing down barriers between students and teachers. And I suspect the same is true. Uh, for, for little ones as well, you know, so that would be probably my number one thing would be to think about different ways to humanize and be transparent and vulnerable, set the example, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I was about to say something similar. Um, having community building activities or relationship building questions that you can possibly ask, you know, once every day, or whatever is the, the timeline that fits within your space. Research shows that when we know more about each other, we treat each other better. Mm -hmm. And so if we are asking kids questions so they can share a little bit about themselves with us, I think we, just like what you're doing, we should share a little bit of ourselves with them. Mm -hmm. And over time, that relationship would build and grow. And the whole goal would be that the kids would connect with one another so that the kids can connect with us as educators. Mm -hmm. So at that point, they can connect to the content. It's mm -hmm. a process that we shall all respect. It makes me think about um, an icebreaker activity I did at the middle school level. Um, it just involved like a ball of yarn that you purchased from Walmart. And so I would start holding the yarn. I would stand in the, in the middle of a circle. My students would um, circulate themselves around the classroom. And then I would tell them who I was, where I was from, and where I worked. And someone within that circle, if they were able to identify with something that I said, I would toss the yarn to them, continuing to hold my string. I had to wrap it around my finger. And then when the next person got the yarn, they would say something about themselves and where they grew up or something that they like to eat. And then when someone else in the circle identified, they would raise their hand and they toss the yarn. And so what happened over the course of the activity is that you had interconnectedness. So you had yarn going from different angles and it started with me, but it didn't end with me. 
And so the whole point of that icebreaker was to get the students to see that we're connected, even though we don't all we didn't all know each other prior to this moment. There are so many things outside of this classroom that connects us. And so we take those same connections, we bring them into the room, and then we build our family, and then we create our climate, and then we build our classroom culture. And so always going back to we're connected that way. Even when we can't see it, we all are. Oh my gosh, I love that activity because the society makes us focus on how we're so different, but that activity just lifts up how we're so much more alive. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, love it. You know, you know what, Sharon, you made me think about something my grandmama used to tell me, and I'm famous for grandmama colloquialism because I'm from the South, and she would all say that, she would all say, at the end of the day, we all cry the same blood right? And so what she means by that is whenever pain hits our lives, the way that that pain impacts us is all the same. That's one commonality that we have as people. And so when we take those similarities and we build upon those and we share those things, it keeps us together. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I want to add there too that, you know, to the, to the point of healing and really collective healing, I think uh, a lot of the times our conversations are uh, focus more on individual type stuff. But in reality, uh, to your point or your grandma's point, um, is if, if, I, if I'm hurting, then it really is your problem too. Because, you know, uh, if, if, we're, if we're working in a teaching and, uh, teaching and learning context, right, and I'm your student and I'm hurt and I'm, I'm, I'm having some, some struggles here, then that impacts you and that impacts the environment of the class, right? So mm -hmm. it's in our best interest to, uh, what I say, le learn to shoulder each other's burdens. Uh, and that's really what this work has, has been for me is trying to understand what that looks like in different areas uh, and really moving us more toward a collective healing mindset, I think. I like that. I don't know if I've ever heard it termed that way, a collective healing like mindset. Mm -hmm. I like it, I think. I like that. Great. This is, I love all, I love concrete ideas. And so Shanika, I really love the yarn activity. Um, I have a fifth grade son and, you know, the first week of school, they did a lot of social connection activities. And he did some, he told me something similar to what you did. They, they had a water bottle. They each put their water bottle in front of them and then someone would go in the middle of the circle and say something about themselves. And then if you agreed, you would go in the circle with them and you can kind of see how, how much similarity you had with each other. So I love very concrete activities like that. I think educators are super creative um, in coming up with these things. So, um, you know, I think the past year and a half, particularly with the pandemic and remote learning in a lot of ways has had disproportionate kind of impacts on different groups of people. Um, maybe communities of color, marginalized communities, um, low income or single parent families um, and those kinds of things. So as we go back to school um, this fall, how can districts and schools, in your ideas, meet every student's social, emotional, and academic needs in ways that are equitable and inclusive? So I would just love to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, honestly, the schools can't do it alone. Um, you hear the, the phrase, it takes a village. Um, it's going to take a community. Um, the, throughout the pandemic, and I know in, in our district and, and in Texas, you hear of all the mobile food pantries, you know, um, companies providing free Wi-Fi service for families. The, the problem is these issues, this, um, for this population, it's, it's always been the same. It's just been kind of lifted and highlighted, you know, because of the pandemic. Before the pandemic, the schools, it, it was their responsibility. But what we noticed when the community agencies, you know, for food pantries or food banks, the counseling agencies, um, all these different groups getting together to work together to serve the needs of these marginalized groups, that is when we really begin to make headway and increase access and opportunities for families who've always needed it. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think for, for me, at least in this part of the country, uh, it's, it's becoming 
increasingly uh, more important to to focus on where those inequities are. So, you know, it, it, a lot of school districts just operate status quo like, and, um, and maybe this will be an event that causes folks to slow down for a second and focus on what the inequities are. All right, um, and who who is being excluded? Um, those are things that I think we have to identify first in order to really put something in place. Um, so that's something that I think uh, schools will certainly need to do a better job at. I, one of the things that I've seen work here is maybe appointing a few key folks to kind of marshal the transformative work. You know, to, so for one to take up the the uh, the job of identifying where the biggest uh, gaps are. Um, and then coming together to, to use that data to try to drive some sort of policy or, or, or initiatives around uh, closing those gaps. Um, at Rowan, um, we have the, the, the Partnership for Educational uh, Equity and Research that's uh, headed up by uh, Dr. Zion. She, she works with me and leads that, uh, that group. But we work with 26 school districts around our area and basically our job is to develop these long-term partnerships uh, to uh, spend the first year sort of building some foundational content knowledge, second year building some research skills so that they can analyze what's going on in their own context. And then as a part of our gradual release and responsibility, uh, the third year is really us, you know, just kind of supervising that process because uh, we're really trying to build autonomy too so that the next time um, the, the next big event comes, they'll have some skills and, and, a, and a group of people uh, that can take the charge up. So I, I think we need to see more of that, um, what I call like micro movements developing within uh, school districts uh, so that they can be much more responsive to this work. So hopefully we will see that uh, more across the country. Great. I'd love to move to the topic of civic engagement, which is really I think uh, the bulk of our conversation and where I'd like to focus our conversation. So it's something I've been thinking a lot about recently, particularly the intersection between social emotional learning and civic engagement. But you know, as I was preparing for our discussion today, I was thinking like, what does civic engagement really mean? Like, does it mean different things to different folks? And I was reflecting on what it really meant to me and how I defined it. And I was just thinking about young people these days. And in a lot of ways, I think they're much more civically engaged than I was when I was their age. Like I think back to my own youth, I don't think I got really civically minded or civically engaged probably till I was in college. And I remember distinctly, I took, I'm a psychologist, I was a psychology major. I took a class on psychology of women. And I remember coming home to like do laundry or something and having dinner with my family and just having a really heated conversation with my dad about gender inequities, because I was learning it all in class, and just getting really motivated to do stuff around that, and having this heated conversation with my dad. And my sister, who was younger than me at the time, was in high school, and she's like, okay, that was a scary conversation, because we were you know, kind of arguing about it and discussing it. But now I have a 13-year-old, and he has those conversations with me all the time, and he's been having those conversations with me for years on different topics. And I just think back, I never thought that way when I was his age, and I see a lot of his peer groups doing the same. And so, you know, that in a lot of ways um, is very promising to me that young people are thinking about these issues that affect their community. And so I would just love to hear, like, what does civic engagement mean to you? Um, and, and how do you kind of define it? Or what do you see, how do you see it defined in action, I guess, is another way to think about it. Well, Tia, I have a 14-year-old. Okay. <laughs> and I have similar conversations. Are they heated and as mine, though? Because mine can get a little heated with him. <laughs> I think it's just this, this generation. I mean, we've all heard of cancel culture. They are first to call out what is not right, and they, they're very, um, and, and it's more than talk. They decide to not engage with that particular person or product. But in, if I was to describe or define civil engagement, I think it's putting your passion, that fire, into action to work towards a better world. I, I do. And, the, and this is a very passionate generation. Yes, I totally agree. And I, 
in a lot of ways, it's very impressive to me because I don't think I was that passionate when I was that it's young. Bold. Yes, very and, so. Maybe as we get older too, we're like frustrated, like y'all just y'all need to y'all need to slow down. You know what I mean? Like be a kid for a minute. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, to, to the point about civic engagement, I think it for me, it's it's really about um, holding some sort of position. You know, like uh, I, I think um, at least in in the work that I've done with teachers uh, and, and college students, we really try to move away from this position of neutrality, uh, where you don't necessarily have to take a stance. Um, and what we've learned about that is a neutral stance is really a pro status quo stance, you know? So whether that's a conflict avoidant behavior or, you know, it's, it's contextually driven, meaning, you know, around these folks, I can really be myself, but around these folks, I can't really say too much because I don't want to, you know, be um, excluded from the social relationships. Um, but I, I think when we think about civic engagement there, it, it's about holding a position on matters uh, and it's about engaging in action toward advancing your position. Uh, and then thirdly, I would say it's also about being reflective about that. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, because uh, I got a 22 year old, a 19 year old, my five year old is, he argues, but he doesn't really have a position. Um, but uh, like with my oldest ones, they can do the first two, that is hold a position, try to advance an agenda, but I don't think they're being very reflective about what it is that they're saying. You know, what are the long-term implications? Where do they get that information from? Uh -huh. uh, you know, when I think about civic engagement, I really think about like, it, it's, it's much richer than I think our kids understand it to be. Um, and so, you know, to that point, are we just not teaching the different layers of civic engagement? I don't really know, but I do see more of it. I, I think there's less reflection on the positions that they're taking. Do you see, so I guess another way to interpret that is it's a lot of loud voices, but maybe not a reflection of what they're saying, I guess, or um, supporting. Would, be, would that be another way to think about what you're saying? I think so. Yeah, I, I think um, there's a there's a deeper skill involved with that reflection piece. So here, here's what I think I think. Here's how I know, you know, where those ideas came from. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a, a lot of my new thinking is coming from new information that I've received from professors and so forth, you know. And so then we add that into our lexicon and test it out and we get different responses and we go, oh, OK, so this is OK. I like this position. You know, um, but how do we, you know, enhance their ability to re be reflective on that and who's impacted by those beliefs and positions and, and so forth? Those are some of the deeper questions that I think we could still answer um, uh, with our with our kids, particularly with the older ones. Can I add to, to your comment? I agree with both of you, um, but to the reflective piece, I think a way to maybe best support those that are younger than us, and I have a 19-year-old son that's very vocal about a lot of different things, um, where he receives his information on all times, I'm not always sure. Social media plays a big part um, in his decision-making and the way that he forms his opinions. But I think when we, and when I say we, I'm including myself with this in being reflective, thinking about the way or the ramification or the weight of our words and how they impact others around us that may help provide just a little bit more context for your son I'm thinking about. So when you say something and you've already allowed it to come out of your mouth, like who are your words impacting? How long is that impact going to last? One thing about your words is you cannot retract them because people will always, they might not, they may forget what you said, but they're going to remember how your words impacted them and they, how they made you feel. And I guess that's also another piece of social emotional learning, thinking about what you're doing and what you're saying and how it's impacting the community and the world around you. You're responsible for what you say. And so maybe incorporating that or teaching that piece to our children will maybe help maybe quiet down some of our more vocal persons and their opinions that are very strong. That's what I'm thinking. I, you know, that's a great segue, actually, Shanika, to my next uh, question or thought is really, what do you see as the intersection between social emotional learning and civic engagement? I think there's been a lot of discourse lately around 
how social emotional learning could play a bigger part in helping youth be more civically engaged. Uh, and so just would love to hear your thoughts on that. And how does supporting SCL in, in particular help with civic engagement? I was sharing with a colleague earlier today and um, sharing with her about this experience in particular and letting her know how excited I was um, about it. And one of the things that I took away from the conversation and shared was that oftentimes when SEL is presented at a school level, it's almost like what happens at the school is what you learn, but that isn't always transcribed into your home life or at work. And so it's almost like it's compartmentalized. This is what I learned at school. This is SEL. And then when I get home, those same conversations are not had or the language is not had. And so the awareness of self and the social emotional learning that I'm experiencing there, it's not permeating my house. And so I think that there is a breakdown between where the information is being shared and how it's um, impacting our homes and our communities. It's almost like a container or a vessel. If I were to bring in a vase and I constantly pour SEL content into it and love and support and all of those great things, and I do that Monday through Friday, but there's a pinhole like um, pinhole on the side of it, and I send it out on Friday, it doesn't come back until Monday. Half or more of that content is going to be gone, so I'm having to replenish it Monday through Friday again. And that's how I look at our kids. We do amazing jobs in our fields and in our professions by filling that vessel, and then we send them to environments where that is not perpetuated. And so there needs to be a bridging or a gapping, but first it's going to require a certain level of trust. I'm not quite sure what it looks like where everybody else was, but my mind goes back to when I was a teacher at Zucker. There were great things that I taught my kids, but because of the relationship between the home and the school was frayed, a lot of those lessons didn't carry over to the home. And so they didn't carry over into the community. And so it didn't carry over into the kid thinking about how they could impact their community through civic engagement. And so it's just not one place. It needs to like needs to spread, needs to keep moving. Does that make sense? No, it, it definitely makes sense. And I'm sitting here thinking that we're kind of like at this cross worlds, whereas civic engagement is about working towards solving the issues in our community and society. So you have people, I think all of us want to, to get it right. Mm -hmm. but we're at this intersection of civic engagement, you know, wanting to get it right. And also social awareness, which is a competency of SEL, which is, you know, taking the time instead of seeking to be right, we have to seek to understand, taking mm -hmm. the different perspectives. All of us come into our classrooms, all of us come into our spaces with different stories, with different strengths. But if we take the time to understand where a person is coming from, and how they enter the space and also taking the time to understand the, the people that are impacted by the, the work of the civil the civic engagement, then at that time, we will truly have solutions that are inclusive, that are equitable, that are sustainable, and we do it together as a community. But until we focus on that, that understanding piece, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, you look at the literature, the school to prison pipeline, uh, that's, uh, you know, read uh, uh, Rich Milner, Tyrone Howard, uh, Monique Morris, um, you know, these discipline, uh, these disciplinary actions push kids out of school and then funnel them into the uh, carceral system where they literally do uh, lose the ability to be civically engaged. You know, once, once you're locked up, you don't get to participate in the same type of way. So many groups can demonstrate low, little to no socio-emotional skills, but from a racial standpoint, uh, they, they tend to get treated differently. And that, of course, is compounded by gender as well. Um, you know, you look at the literature on, on black girls, for example, you'll see that um, they're criminalized in, in, in very harsh ways. So uh, I think that, that there are some promising connections there, but I'm still trying to work through what that relationship looks like between, you know, more SEL skills will equal more civic engagement or, or what, you know, what does that relationship look like? Yeah, you know, the way, 
The way I've been thinking about it lately is really thinking about, I, I kind of reflect on like my own children. Like what do I want them to take away from learning or having greater social emotional competencies? And I always tell them, and I think my husband and I always tell them, you know, at the end of the day, we want you to like be good people and, and kind of use like your education and what you're doing and what you're learning in school to help better your community and society in some way, right? So to me, that's how I kind of see the link because I totally get your point, Adam. I see that too. I think there's arguments around that. But to me, it's really about how do you take um, some of the social emotional skills and competencies that, you're, that you could gain and really think about outside of your own individual self and reflecting around the community around you and doing like, problem solving with other folks in your community to help kind of better um, and provide better solutions for that community. Um, and so that's the way I've been trying to frame it um, lately in my own head. Um, and I think it reflects on what Sharon and Shanika were saying around community that really resonated with me as well. It makes me think about um, the discussion and the question that we're on makes me think or reflect about a time um, in my life where I was transitioning from one place to another um, and how I, I was a young mother. I had my son when I was um, in my early 20s. And so I, I understood that, that having my son, I was responsible for him and providing for him. Um, and I was so focused on providing for him financially that I um, unintentionally neglected his social emotional well-being at times. Um, so I had to choose between being there for him and nurturing him or providing for him. And so as, from a personal standpoint, there was a hierarchy of needs. I understood that I, at a later time, might have the ability to impact my communi community civically, but I was in a place where I was trying to preserve myself and I was trying to preserve and support and live for my son. And so I think when we create systems where persons are able to sustain themselves and they don't have to choose. I would have loved to have been in both places figuratively, so to speak, at the same time, but I had to make a choice and I had to make a decision. And so I had to choose between being there for Christian, that's his name, right? Being there for him and being actively involved in all of these things around me within my community. And so I, I, I took up a very selfish standpoint. I had to preserve me in my house first. You know, now I'm able to be able to immerse myself in more community involvement. And I'm able to learn more. And sometimes I say I'm behind the ball because I was so busy working here. I couldn't focus in those other areas. I don't know about anyone else, but a large part of my community from where I'm from are I'm in the same position. You have to make a decision. How can I help the whole if the part of me is not, you know? You know, Shanequa, I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit. Um, mm -hmm. When you look at the SEL competencies, you know, the self-awareness, the self-management, relationship skills, responsible decision-making, all these different things. Although you were financially, you're, you were hyper-focused mm -hmm. on financially, you know, creating this, this life for your you and your son, you were pouring all these things, you were modeling all these things, you know, and for your child and even for your community. Because think about it, we're all a 15 second decision away from life being totally different. You could have done some really rough things in order to provide, but you made other decisions instead. Mm -hmm. You know, you reflected on who you were or who you wanted to be as a mom, your strengths, your limitations, and what you wanted for your child. That's all self-awareness. You know, you were, although, and I know, it, as you described, you were dealing with a lot of different emotions but you were coping and you weren't trying to get rid of your feelings, but you're still here. So you figured out a way to appropriately express those emotions so you can be who you needed to be for your child. And your child is the product that you are sharing with with society that's making the world a better place. When I work with different teachers and they, they kind of lump, oh, social emotional learning, I'm not doing it, something extra, whatever. Once we really start diving into the things that they do and aligning it to each one of the SEL competencies, they're like, well, you know what? I am doing that. 
oh, you know, oh my gosh, had no idea that's what it was. And, and we validate our teachers. We validate ourselves in the work that we're doing so that we can lift each other up and lift ourselves up. And that to me is civic engagement. I didn't look at it like that. And I, you know what, at the time, at that place in my life, I felt so isolated. You know, I was, I felt isolated. And I think part of it, Sharon, was um, the weight of the responsibility. And I think the secret shame of some past decisions. I felt like I couldn't, I wasn't civically involving anyone. But I think I wanna say thank you for making me aware that even when I was unintentionally engaging others that I was. And I, I think if I were looking at someone else, I may have been able to eloquently say to them what you said to me. I think that sometimes in looking at self, we don't see the impact and the rippling effect that we have with others. So thank you for saying that to me. Thank you for supporting me in that way. I don't know if I saw that until today. You know, people don't pay, you're welcome. People don't pay attention to what we say. They pay attention to what we do. And you are a living, breathing model every single day. And now, and now you're not as hyper-focused. Now your eyes, you're beginning to see that, oh, I am being more engaged, but you were engaged anyway, girl. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I can't, I can't help but, but, you know, maybe this is just, you know, the nature of my work, but uh, point out, the tensions in this work, right? Um, you know, to, to be able to think about how in the midst of those conditions, um, many of us just, we, we do the best that we can, um, but we just in general, we, we fail to to talk about the, the bigger limiting factors on us. You know, like, why is it that my mom is struggling? You know, like she is doing a great job and she's, uh, you know, uh, uh, she's implementing social emotional strategies, whether she called it that or not. But I think sometimes this causes us to, to, to be able to zoom out and go, yes, yeah, she's really good at it, but why does that keep happening to her? What is that? What are the, the bigger outside forces that put people in positions to have to be so good at using their social emotional skills and like, you know, diversifying the way that they become civically engaged. Um, and, and, and so that's, that's one of the tensions for me that I think it is, is a real promising site for the work is to really uh, zoom out and take a macro look at not just the individual skills that kids can learn, but to the civic engagement point, or maybe it's more of a social political conscious piece, like how can the growth of those skills then empower young people and adults really to transform the conditions that bring on this collective suffering that we experience, some of us experience. It goes back to your uh, earlier point, Adam, really, when you were saying, when, when I asked what was the definition of civic engagement and you brought up, you know, people, youth have to be really reflective, right? And I think that's what you're getting at now is that maybe that's the connection, right? It's not that they have to like take these skills, they have to look at what's kind of happening in the society and communities around them and put two, to, two and two together, right? And really reflectively think about, well, how am I gonna take these skills and figure out and let's let me figure out what the problem is and how am I going to take these skills and apply it to hopefully try to address the problem is what I'm hearing. I think that's uh, that what you said earlier, that's where the tension is, right? And makes me think just, you know, is it important then for schools and educators to really prioritize connecting uh, social emotional competencies to larger questions of civic responsibility and justice? Like, should we really be making that link? and making it more explicit and help them with those reflection pieces. Just what do you all think, given that inherent tension that Adam, I think is really appropriate for you to bring up. Even if we don't, they're going to discover it on their own. And so what we use a term in education called scaffolding, which is really what I think about as an onion, you're peeling back the layers. And so when you teach, your, when you teach children and you're teaching yourselves to be more inquisitive and ask more questions, the more that you peel back, the more wise, and hows and whens, okay, and how did that happen? And when this occurred, what was the result of that? And so when we continue to ask those questions, we will get to the root cause of the problem. It's all about asking questions. At some point, we'll get there. I think a few of us have already made that journey, but our kids will. 
I agree. I, and my answer is yes. Um, making those connections create clarity. Um, mm -hmm. And when you do that, it's, it's one of those where, okay, this has happened. We didn't always get it right. But what can I do right now within my sphere of influence in order to work towards getting it right? And those are the conversations that I have with my 18 year old and my 14 year old. Yeah, I think I think there are some promising connections. And, and um, for me, I think if, if we can figure out how to take the work and deepen it, uh, broaden it to address issues of power and culture as well, I think uh, we, we would be looking at the next phase of the work, you know, to have a much uh, a bigger impact for, for, for kids and caregivers. Yeah. You know, I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I wish I, we were actually in person, um, but unfortunately we're, you know, running out of time. So, you know, just to conclude, you know, I really appreciate the discourse. But if there was um, anything that you'd love to share with folks on, you know, what you're currently working on or what you're really passionate about these days, I'd love to hear what that is. Gosh, um, I'm really passionate about adult social emotional competence and wellness. I feel like we cannot give what we don't have. Um, the pandemic is a golden opportunity for us to model the skills that we would like to see within our kiddos because we have all experienced the shared trauma. So um, building our adults up so that they can take care of the littles, mm. that's, that's what my work is about. I'll, I'll share, I, I, uh, I'm continuing to kind of explore that intersection of race and trauma. And, and one of the things that um, I've really come to understand is that to, 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 to shift the discourse away from this westernized medical, you know, what, I, what I've called white dominant colonial logic, um, it's important for us to bring in multiple ways of knowing. So for me, uh, you know, thanks to my, my colleague, uh, Abiola Frende Wu, she's over at uh, the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Um, she's been really helping me better understand this work be, uh, by bringing in the work of black feminism. Um, that's not an area that I'm really familiar with, uh, but as I'm becoming familiar with, I'm, t I'm telling you, it, it's, it's really changing my views on trauma, suffering, and healing. Uh, so I really push us, I think, uh, and the listeners of this conversation to think outside of that mainstream book. You know, don't just go and pick up the newest SEL book. Read outside of your, the genre to try to understand how socio-emotional skills and learning and competency show up in other in other in other texts. You know, let us do the work of analyzing other texts to see how it emerges. I would say the English teacher smiles. I like that he said analyzing the text. I like that he said that. I had this answer together last night and I wanted to sound really smart. Yeah, but I feel comfortable with this group. And so I'm just going to speak from my heart. And so um, what I want to leave is that I've committed to healing myself. Um, and I realized that when I'm healed and when I'm whole and when I'm safe, I can impact the lives of those around me. I want every person that I'm connected with to be whole and, and sound and in their thoughts and in their emotions. I'm committed to helping the people that I'm connected to. And on whatever that looks like, I'm open. I'm open to relationships and connectedness after this call. Um, just want to do good work, right? With good people mm -hmm. and live a good life. You know, that resonates with me too. I, you know, I, and what you're saying, Sharon, too. I've been thinking a lot about this and just how important adults are in supporting um, kids. Um, in their own, you know, social emotional journey, and I think um, you're right, Shaniko. I think for all of us, myself included, um, we really have to work on ourselves and make sure that we're socially emotionally strong so that we can support kids positively. So, I appreciate that. I appreciate all of you um, for taking this time away from. I know you're very busy days to have this conversation with me. I really appreciated it. I don't know if. Uh... 
I'd, I'd be happy to, to connect with folks who are, if you're interested in talking outside of here or collaborating, uh, but also to, to the listeners as well, if they're interested in reaching out, I, I would welcome questions. Just again, thank you so much for all your time and I really appreciate the conversation and uh, hope that we can continue the discourse um, outside of here and hopefully around food sometime. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. Yes. Have a great rest of the week. Same. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am T. I was the facilitator on the video. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope you appreciated the conversation and the discourse as much as I did when I was facilitating it. So I would, you know, we've gotten some questions and I'm going to take um, maybe seven or eight minutes or so to answer some of these questions for you. Um, let me see, I'm just going. Um, so one question that we got in the Q&A and actually uh, a a precinct question as well. A couple of them reflected the same theme. So it's how can we en encourage civil discourse among elementary school students while keeping SEL in mind? Um, I think some of this was talked about in the video that you all watched. But again, I think the way um, I think about it is really thinking about those critical SEL skills that are important to have really good civil discourse and civil engagement. So really thinking about perspective taking, um, thinking critically about what might be impacting your own community um, and people around you and trying to learn from others and trying to collectively solve those community problems together. And I think um, those kinds of skills and discussions can happen even um, at a young age because I think all kids, um, are cognizant of kind of what's going on around them. So that's what I would say on that. And then let me see another question. So here's a good question. Um, it says, you know, I like the conversation about words, actions, and behaviors on the community. The world in which we are living um, tends to be um, Eurocentric or individualistic and not from a collective, collectivist frame. How can we promote the notion of community in the world of social media, which emphasizes a me culture? Um, and that's a really big question. We have to think about that duplicity. And I think um, that is a really important thing to think about. I know um, in the development of our programs, we really try to take both of those lenses um, and think about not only how does SEL um, help an individual, but how does it help individuals um, to form a collective and really think about problems from a community or group standpoint and really impact those for good. Another thing, um, I think that SEL could do to promote this idea is really um, thinking about providing opportunities for all children to see themselves either in a, a program or a conversation. Um, and then also being able to see other different points of views and lived experiences and to learn from that um, so that everyone can share um, in that collective learning. Uh, let me see. Um, there was another uh, question that actually came in um, earlier, thinking about how do we have these conversations with parents um, who may think that being civically engaged is has something to do or is correlated with politics. Um, and again, I think it goes back to helping parents understand that um, every community has its own unique issues and problems. And again, it's getting um, kids um, and youth to think about that and what's impacting the communities that they live in uh, and to think critically about that and try to figure out solutions to that. So um, I think that in 
helps all kids. Let me see. This is such a great topic. I wish I could talk to all of you actually, instead of just answering your questions. It'd be great conversation. Yeah, let me see. I really like uh, this comment, although they, it's not really a question from one of our guests. Um, I think of civic engagement and SEL connection as mutually beneficial. Civic engagement requires knowledge, knowledge about power, how it shifts through institutions and laws and skills to choose the best strategy for change based on understanding the context, relationships and systems at play and emotional engagement, whether you call it passion or spark is a critical piece of the civic engagement and integration with SEL. I think that is a great comment and actually highlights a lot of how SEL skills and competencies really does play a big part. And like this person said, is mutually beneficial to being civically engaged. Um, let's see. Um, I'll probably take one more question. It looks like there was a question around um, measuring SEL impact. Um, I think it's important to do so. I think there are a lot of really good research-based measures and assessments out there that measure SEL competencies. I think the thing to think about though, and related to this topic is, what are really ultimately the outcomes that we're trying to improve? Um, and you know, things around student belonging and feeling included and being engaged, um, I think are important outcomes that we would hope that SEL competencies improve and thinking about civic engagement as well as an outcome um, and whether or not we're moving the needle on that is important as well. So I think we are at time and I'm gonna hand it back over to Castle, but thank you all so much for listening and participating. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Kim. We really appreciate your being here today and for your facilitating um, the pre-recorded conversation. Um, please share with the panelists that um, their comments and their insights, uh, they were just so rich and wonderful. So we really appreciate um, Committee for Children bringing together that discussion and sharing with us today. Um, and we also wanna thank Committee for Children again for their sponsorship of um, the SEL Exchange, which is coming up on October 14th. Um, registration for the virtual summit is open and there is a link um, there on your screen and in chat. And we'll also include it in um, the email that you'll get tomorrow so that you can go ahead and register for the exchange. We'd love to have everyone one participate um, in that four hours of learning as well. And just a reminder, you'll be receiving an email tomorrow, uh, again, with a link to register for the SEL exchange, um, as well as with a link to the recording. So you can um, watch any part of that conversation again, or feel free to share it with colleagues as well. Uh, that email will also include your certificate of attendance. So keep an eye out tomorrow for that. Um, thank you again for joining us. Um, thank you, Dr. Kim, for being here with us. And again, a special thank you to the panelists and for all of their openness and insights that they shared. Um, we hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. And again, we hope to see you October 14th at the SEL Exchange.